the first images, not of earthquake, but of a continuous force so powerful that it was impossible to comprehend. First the shock, then the dawning understanding that in this filthy tide of blackened sea, human life was being extinguished on an unimaginable scale. In this instant, as a reporter, I knew I would have to go. This is my diary of one of the most challenging assignments I have known. I saw these images from the comfort of an airport departure lounge. Soon I would experience their consequence on the ground in Japan. The sheer scale of it. Doubts filled my head. Would I cope? Would I find the words without cliché or hyperbole? a morass of speeding wreckage and sudden moments of detail. Thirteen hours later, I would land in southern Japan. Emerging from Osaka on the airport train, we had a dilemma. Well, the big question is how to get beyond Tokyo, whether we're going to try and take a bullet train which still seems to be working or whether we're going to try and take cars uh, and indeed where we should actually go. I mean at the moment uh, looking down into the agency reports it looks very much as if the nuclear um, issue is quite a big one. Uh, there's supposed to be a leak of some significance from um, one of the reactors that was affected. Um, we will try and get to the epicenter such as it is because of course the main epicenter was in the sea. Um, in uh, the most affected built-up areas, and that, that's really our ambition. As we sped northwards, preparing to report the story, ordinary people all over Japan were already doing our job for us, and we were watching them on our laptops. Oh my God! Oh my God! Japan, the home of the flip phone and the handicap. And because the quake lasted more than four minutes, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people, even amid the fear of imminent injury, perhaps death, amid swaying skyscrapers, filmed and transmitted what was happening to them. Ah. And when the tsunami followed the quake, they filmed that too, as with these images shot from a rooftop on the seafront in Mayako City. Could we professionals have stood our ground in such a moment? Could we have sustained the poise required to film and transmit from a balcony as first cars, vans, trucks, and then your neighbor's properties float past you? The same extraordinary decision to film driving along the coastal highway 
a most vivid insight into what so many must have experienced in their cars. Cars in which we would find so many had died when once we reached the tsunami's wasteland. The first explosion at the Fukushima nuclear plant was replaying over and over again on Japanese television. It meant our journey onward north of Tokyo by car involved a 50 mile detour around the radiation exclusion zone. Tsunami are expected in the following areas. Our focus was on reaching the tsunami's aftermath, but Fukushima was never far from our minds throughout this assignment. Daylight on Sunday, we arrived in the city of Sendai the scale of what we must engage with becoming clearer by the minute. Sendai is the closest city to the epicentre of the huge earthquake. Again, what we can see is never wreckage of earthquake, but of tsunami. This, the remnants of a village carted by the tidal wave from a place five miles away. I look out from the motorway embankment that halted the wave, the dividing line between chaos and order. In the commercial district of the city, the water had receded, leaving cars at crazy angles wrapped around lampposts. Farman recovered another body, a blue sheet protecting it from public view. There were cars that for so many others had been coffins. Is it right for us to wade out and see the bodies for ourselves? Suddenly we were confronted with the enormity of individual loss. A woman in her 70s searching for her husband. He was tending his paddy field. Have you seen him? Have the firemen seen him? I wondered, was he the man plucked with such care from the wreckage now born in a cortege towards the road? This is a country built against the threat of earthquake and tsunami, the warnings worked. Huge numbers did escape to high ground. Is that news I should report when so many died? Should I stress in my report how dedicated and ordered these rescuers are? Or should I anyway dwell simply on the dead? By now we were divided into two teams. Whilst I was amid the wreckage in Sendai, my reporter colleague Alex Thompson was thrusting further north. <laughs> Even before we left London, the name of Minamisan Riki had become synonymous with the scale of the tsunami's power. We learned that of the 17,000 people who lived here, 10,000 were missing dead. One resident filmed the town as it was engulfed. This was the scene on Sunday when Alex's team was one of the first to reach here. The destruction was total. We found ourselves making the awesome comparison with the wartime images of Hiroshima a comparison none of us had ever wished to have to make. This is Miss Enrico from the air, but satellite imagery allows us almost instant access to the imprint of disasters like this. Sendai before and Sendai after. Yagawahama, Natori. At least half a million homes gone along this coast. In some ways, it's easier for the reporter to deal with the vastness of disaster. The deeply personal is harder, particularly in Japan. Akihiro and his son Fukiyaki don't know if his wife and daughter have survived. 
They've been walking through the destruction for three hours to this rescue center. These are scenes we are used to in disaster. In Japan, they are rare. This is not a culture that wears its heart on its sleeve. On Sunday night, we broadcast for the first time from the earthquake zone. There was no power for our lights. Car headlights would have to do. The time difference meant we were on air at 4 a.m. Monday, a couple of hours sleep and we're off again to Sendai's brand new international airport. No planes, but trees and cars littering the terminal. And a cottage landed at international arrivals. I spotted the architect's mall, a sprig of spruce as if signalling the end of this latter-day Noah's flood. Four days earlier, CCTV footage captured the moment the tsunami swept across the airport. Inside the terminal, passengers filming and gasping. The parking lot cleared of vehicles by the force of the water on Friday. Today, all but vanished beneath thousands of tons of debris. A clear-up operation is already underway for fear the airport will be needed for nuclear evacuation. Yes, the unseen nuclear crisis, so secondary to what we can see. On the roads surrounding the airport, we follow along behind what has now become the biggest mobilization of Japanese forces since the Second World War. 100,000 men and women on the move. Now the waters are down, dare I worry about standing on exposed nails when so many people lie beneath this debris? Here and there, a deeply personal fragment of a former life surfaces. What story does it tell? Who gave it? Who received it? And are they beneath here too? Some survivors have begun to venture back to try to find a few personal belongings. Do you know anybody here who has died or who is missing? A lot. A lot? I mean dozens? That's not, that's way more than a dozen. Really? Some survivors have begun to venture back to try to find a few personal belongings. People walk amongst the ruins of their former lives and salvage what they can from the mud. I really want her story, but understandably she doesn't want to talk. And I must not press. At the school, the clock still showed the hour the quake struck. The army stood guard over four blanket-covered bodies. Japan's government doesn't want bodies filmed, and yet people died. Surely I must suggest that. <laughs> Further up the coast, Alex Thompson and his team have made it into Kesanuma. Here, one picture. An entire tuna fishing fleet, ripped from its moorings, cast upon the town, tells so many thousands of words. A way of life. The men who lived it, the port in which they did so, ended. Even those who have survived have lost everything. This man is searching for the home he's lived in for most of his life. It's his house, here. As a reporter, you see in him the ultimate human connection with ourselves. Hear him, and we understand his loss. All at once, this wave just came towards us. I've never seen anything like it. From down low, like this, you couldn't outrun it. But the ones who didn't bother to go, they're all missing. How many people? Mm. So, so many. 
hundreds, thousands. Back in Sendai, as dusk falls, we drive back through what once were the coastal suburbs. Can I, as a reporter, even begin to do justice to what has happened here? Translate such wreckage into something that connects with our own existence so many thousands of miles away in Britain? I leave the camera lingering on one more victim. It's Tuesday, day five. Another explosion reported at Fukushima. The nuclear story now vying with the rescue story. The news desk in London was becoming increasingly concerned for our safety. If things got much worse, would we be able to evacuate in time to avoid damaging contamination? It was getting harder and harder to cover the ground and the story. We got as close to Fukushima as we dared. This is Mizusawa, 40 miles from the leaking nuclear plant. Virtually no damage, but the town is deserted. The petrol stations have run dry. It's a random town, and yet even here there is organization for rescue and evacuation. Yet curiously, they seem unfazed by the prospect of nuclear radioactivity, more concerned with the more immediate issues like lighting, fuel and food. In Mizusawa's tsunami refuge, these women could remember the last time Japan faced the unseen threat of atomic radiation. I've just had surgery on my knees and I can't move my leg. I can't climb stairs as easily as other people can. The television says it isn't safe to eat the vegetables. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm 74 and I remember the Second World War. We had nothing to eat then. I'm frightened. We can't do anything. I feel powerless. I don't know what is going to happen to us. I feel so worried. If anywhere here can be said to be the front line, then Ofunata is it. The bulldozers managed finally to blast their way through to the devastation. Like so many towns before, the account of loss was the same. We need repetition to represent scale, but I began to wonder whether the viewer could bear much more. But there was something different here. A group of Chinese workers returning to the remnants of their fish processing plant. This is a town where only gulls and hawks find anything of value. And it was here that we witnessed one of the most surreal moments during our time in Japan. Every day, the town sends a daily five o'clock music signal across its public address system to tell children the school day is over. So it is this day. It's Wednesday. It was snowing. Earthquake, tsunami, and now the survivors must wrestle with the bitterest winter weather. Our driver, Shin, last here two years ago, cannot recognize what he's seeing. Anyone still stranded here is searching for the most basic of needs. Well, to be frank, I need a bath and stuff like that, but I know it's too much to ask. It's so cold here. We need kerosene and we need petrol. By now, we're beginning to think about what will arise from this inundation. Will they seriously repeat the sea wall? Will they simply write off this entire strip of coastal land? Our teams were exhausted. We'd been filming for five days, broadcasting to viewers at four in the morning our time. We had been summoned home. 
But driving back to Tokyo, I couldn't escape thinking about the human toll. People told me it's not the Japanese way to speculate about possible death tolls before numbers can be confirmed. In a way, we didn't need to know. By now, the nuclear crisis was somehow overwhelming the evolving human cost of the tsunami. Nuclear information remained hard to get, often late, wrong or difficult to understand. Rarely was it transparent, making it doubly hard to report. But then, with the explosion of the third reactor, the authorities were forced into taking unprecedented action. The emperor has almost never gone on television. Now he had to. The emperor may be concerned. The prime minister's spokesman, when I caught up with him, still seemed much less so. We've only mentioned one of the plants at Fukushima. Uh, there's another plant there. There's a plant at Onagawa, and there's a plant at Takai. We haven't heard any more about them. Are they completely under control now? Um, I, I think you know they are under control, and uh, uh, we. You we think are, they're under control, we, or you we, know we, they're under control? We have not seen any evidence uh, of uh, developments of uh, troubles. Leaving for home, Japan's military were forlornly still trying to bomb the overheating reactors with seawater. Just over a week ago, this was a situation few could have imagined. And judging by the response, no one had ever planned for. Thursday evening, I'm home. A viewer now, not a reporter. The amateur footage still emerging from Japan is compelling. This yet one more vignette of heroism. Jumping out of a taxi was, for this man, the best decision he ever made. The tallest building around was their best hope for survival. As they got in, the water was already gathering around their feet. Within seconds, it had become a raging torrent. Filming all the while as shipping containers and other detritus moved past the building. The taxi he had left by now itself floating. And while its occupants are now safe, many did not make it. There's a woman on the wall, a man up a tree. And standing on a car roof, a father clings to his two young children. A fire hose has become a rescue rope. This canopy, a bridge across the water. As the snow falls, the rescue continues. Even into the darkness, the man and his children finally safe. It seems the instinct to film, to record, to transmit even, is almost as strong as the instinct to survive. Perhaps it is the conceivable threat to us of nuclear fallout that fixes our focus on Fukushima's reactors. At least the pictures, if not the truth, about what's happening are clearer. Inevitably, we focus too on the potential sacrifice made by these volunteer firefighters getting their marching orders before heading off to the plant to help cool the overheating nuclear core. We expect a lot of difficulties with the mission we have been given. I think it is really a dangerous assignment. The reputation of Japan and the lives of many people rest on your actions. Back at my desk in London, I feel, as so often before, a sense of desertion, of leaving a story half told. Do we have any real idea of what's going on at the Fukushima nuclear plant? Do we have any sense of the true scale of loss of life in Japan 
Only this morning, the Japanese government said 15,000 people had died in one prefecture alone. Yet it's also been an incredible privilege to report what has happened, to witness the resilience, the lack of self-pity, the courage of the Japanese people, countered, though, with the opacity of information, the bureaucracy, and above all, the lack of candor from the nuclear industry. I have a sense that I won't be closing my tsunami diary for quite a while.